So, uh, first of all, thank you, Buddhist geeks. Thanks for uh, formulating this panel and for inviting us to actually look into this because I think that for those of us certainly who practice in the Buddhist world, we've, also, we've all been touched by some of the, the, uh, you know, the, the misconduct, you might say, of people in leadership and teachers in different domains of our experience. And, and uh, most of us in this room are not immune from our own versions of misconduct. And so what we're hoping for from this panel is we're hoping to do a number of things, and I'd really kind of like your consent to see if you'll go along with this. So we want to kind of pace what is happening in culture right now and why it is that in the, in the Buddhist tradition in America and in the Zen tradition most recently, although certainly uh, the Tibetan tradition has experienced this as well, um, uh, just what it exactly has been happening. And I would just point out, by the way, that there's a really quite a lovely in, uh, article in Tricycle Magazine this month called Sex and the Dharma, and Shinzen is, is uh, featured along with Jack Cornfield and Lama Paulden and and Grace Sharson is in here too. And they, they're, they're just very beautiful, mature practitioners who give really quite uh, mature and compassionate and, and also s- somewhat rigorous perspectives on this business of scandal. Um, so we want to kind of pace the, the culture. What's happening? Why is this coming out? What is our relationship to it? And then we would like to also get your agreement perhaps to do a little bit of shadow practice. And so we want to kind of move the conversation from what's happening out there to what's happening in here and how can what's happening in here influence what's happening out there, so create a bridge between inside and outside. And I'm just wondering if I have your agreement that you'd be interested in that part of this today. Can you uh, give a little more detail about what the shadow What that could be before I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. With informed consent. <laughs> yeah. We might have our own little scandal right here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So there are really two parts of it, and, and, and it'll depend on how we move energetically. But we're hoping to make this a little bit of a practice session, too. So, so one would be to actually inquire into the ways that I've been hurt in my own relationship life and how maybe, and maybe the other side of that are the ways in which I've, I've engaged my erotic energy or I've in relationship that I've actually injured others. Maybe not at a huge, huge level, but maybe even just small indiscretions that have created suffering for others. And somehow, by opening that little channel up, creating a pathway uh, of both wisdom and compassion. And you'd guide us through that process? Yeah, yeah very simply. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Totally. Okay, great. You're, you're into it. Okay. Is there anybody who says no? I'd be, will you stand up? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So if, you can, if, if you're not able to, we'll certainly create a way for you to participate as a witness or just in whatever way feels really, really right, right to you. And then we may, at a certain point, I want to track how we're doing energetically as we talk about these things. And there might be a moment where I invite Sophia, who is, you know, just a very, um, you know, reliable guide, both in terms of yoga itself and hatha yoga, but also just she's worked so much with the yoga of sexual expertise. You know, she's one of the few teachers who actually can guide us, as Martin was talking about, you know, if we want to learn how to liberate ourselves, she's capable of that. So we may actually have a moment of just yogic practice with a little bit of breath and a little bit of guidance from Sophia, if that interests you as well. How do you feel? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, very good. So, so let's begin then by just kind of pacing the, the primary process. There have been some scandals recently. Sazaki Roshi, maybe I could just start with you, Shinzen. Would you be willing to give just a little bit of background to our audience in terms of what your community's experienced and uh, maybe... About that specifically? Yeah, just the status um, quo of that. Well, um, I'm actually not officially his student. Mm-hmm. Um, I sort of grazed uh, from the outside. Mm-hmm. But he profoundly influenced me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's uh, informed a lot of the ways that I teach. So when all these scandals uh, became evident, it was, uh, it was actually one of the worst things that ever happened to me in my life. Wow. Uh, because it's like, oh my God, I mean, I've been talking about this guy and singing his praises and, uh, for decades, and all this was going on. Um, uh, which to me was uh, completely over the top, unacceptable behavior. Mm-hmm. So um, it, um, it made me think a lot. Uh, 
of, it's like, what is going on here? What does this mean? Um, and um, also, um, you know, it like uh, made people in my community um, feel that somehow they'd been connected to something horrible, even though it's not a direct connection, and uh, even though in my own personal ways of working, it's very much the opposite, uh, because I work within the mindfulness tradition and we, we do the Sheila and all that sort of stuff. But still, there was this indirect connection to this big stink. Um, so that was like really a, a horrible thing. Um, so the, um, uh, it got me uh, think, uh, thinking about, uh, OK, why, <clears throat> why, uh, how can this kind of thing happen? And what should we do about it? So this, there's certain standard things that you're going to hear over and over again in the Buddhist community about, OK, here's how these things happen, and here's what we should do about it. And I would say that those standard things could not be better summarized than uh, the numerous writings of Jack Cornfield mm -hmm. on this subject. He's, got, he's written a lot. Um, and I agree with everything he says. Mm -hmm. So there are certain standard things that we hear, and they're true, and they need to be heard over and over again. And me and Jack and Grace and Lama Pelden pretty much gave voice to those mm -hmm. uh, in, in that, that article. tricycle article. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I hoped for this panel would be that we might go a little further, or take a little, you know, do say mm -hmm. some. There might be something new to say mm -hmm. uh, that is. It's sort of almost dangerous to try to say something new yeah. because people get so emotionally wigged out on this subject. As soon as you start to, uh, as soon as you open your mouth, you're almost uh, screwed. Okay. No <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> nice <laughs> metaphor. <Okay>. <laughs> because I think you could see why. Because. <laughs> If you start to talk about it with some sort of um, intellectual rigor, it, now it just sounds like you're coldly yeah. uh, uh, sort discounting. Of, what's yeah, happening. you're discounting people's feelings, and you're and at some point, let, so a, let, let, let's an do this. Explanation becomes a rationalization. Yeah, so let, let's do this. Let's just let's just say a couple things about what Jack and others have said, and that'll kind of set the tone because I think that needs to be made apparent, which is culture is changing. Things that have been acceptable in other cultures or in earlier times in our culture are not acceptable. As, as the sexual revolution has happened and sexualities come out of the closet, people talk about it, it's on the table. It's no longer, you know, it just simply is not in the background anymore. Um, psychology has taught us that differences in power can uh, leads often to abuse and that people who have less power in situations where sexuality is enacted often come away feeling traumatized or injured and that they should not be taken advantage of. The people in roles of power with dual re that shouldn't create dual relationships. If you're a spiritual teacher making a student your girlfriend, that's really problematic for all kinds of reasons. Psychology's gotten more sophisticated. Um, the feminist movement has insisted that we start relating to women as, as equals, as, as not just simply objects, but actually players in relationship. We've, we, we understand the sophistication of democracy and how in uh, feudal culture and in mythic meme culture that somebody who's imbued with power, power of governance, power of teaching, power of leading, power of everything, financial abuse, sexual abuse. That it, so we, a lot has happened in culture. A lot has changed. And these scandals, to some degree, are a way, you could see it as, a, as almost a healthy movement in culture, in terms of starting to actually say, no, we need to upgrade our organizations, this thing. These things can't go on any longer. Is that fair? Is that a good summary? Does, does that kind of put us at the status quo a bit? Let, let me see if there's anything to add to that. And then I'd like to come back and say, well, what other perspectives do we want to actually bring out that might feel a little bit new or take a slightly different angle on things? Because I feel like if we don't really name that really clearly, that then there is more of a chance that somehow we're going to be seen as not really holding people accountable. Does that make sense to you all? Okay. So what would, what would you add, Kenneth, Sophia, to what I just said? 
I would add, I would add what would you add, Sophia? <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice move. I would, I would add that just to um, begin to explore a conversation that's a little bit of a taboo, which is um, a kind of an innocence about body types, because as soon as you start talking about power over, it becomes a politicization of our, of our bodies. And then there's a representation of one side or the other. Mm -hmm. And to include in the conversation just fundamental differences in bodies, like a feminine body and a masculine body. Um, and to look at that, because that's part of what gets blurred as soon as we look at the responsibility relative to power and submission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> did that make sense? It did to me. Okay. Yeah, do you want her to say a little more? Yeah. Yeah, say, a little, yeah, say a little more. What does that mean is that in our, um, I think, a fantastic evolution into equality, we have done a tremendous amount of neutralization that actually isn't authentic, that a lot of this results in, mm -hmm. is the neutralization, the actually not looking in the face of the actual energies that we wield between each other, and we neutralize, and then there's places where that non-neutralization ends up coming out is from a shadow issue or suppression. So the energy in this room would totally change if we just had the same sex body on one side and the other side. Now it tends to look like subjugation to us because we've worked so hard to intermingle, but there would be a liberation around the field of your body because you get polarized as soon as you bring up a different body to a different body. Not always, but I think that scandal results in the magnetization that becomes big enough to enact upon between bodies. <laughs> so it's the actual neutralization until we can't neutralize anymore. So starting to look at a healthy distinction of the energies that we carry and acknowledge them rather than just neutralizing them is a different way of saying what I just said. Maybe a better way? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think one piece of that would be uh, to talk about maybe the way males in power positions like really simply stated. Do you know this, this is an interesting a fact from the brain science that if you're that that if you get an increase in status as a male that your testosterone goes up do you know that mm -hmm. that your testosterone goes up and that you become literally you become sexier to the to the females and the females on an embodied level actually are attracted to that like that's happening on an energetic evolutionary level that there's more and Mike can tell us a little bit more about that and I think what I hear Sophia saying is that part of the growth in this is not simply for us to, you know, to kind of neutralize the differences in masculine and feminine, but to actually realize that in certain kinds of configurations that certain parts of who we are come online and that we need to bring more consciousness and more awareness to that, which means that we all become sort of more, more sensitive and more sophisticated in terms of our erotic energies and how we wield them. That's a, another way of, of saying what you just said. And added to the testosterone fact, this is just amazing, that regardless of your sexual preference, if you're born in a female human body, you have two-thirds more nerve receptors. So your perception of energy or sensitivity to testosterone is automatically at a higher pitch. So to make use of some of these physiological facts and deal with them is mostly what I think would untie some of, you know, when the bubble ends up bursting, it's not just a power thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. You have something you want to say? Well, I was going to say, that there's a, a good book, Sex and the Spiritual Teacher, which came out, I think, last year or something like that. And uh, I'm on the, the board of the White Plum Association. Sangha, which is the White Plum Teachers, Maizumi Roshi's successors, and there's over a hundred of us. Um, and we, we've kind of been looking at this issue because in our lineage, like all of them, there are these problems. But the interesting thing about the book is it talks about 
going to the testosterone issue, testosterone is not a static hormone. It fluctuates, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, depending on situation, depending on power and everything else. And what's pretty clear when you read the, the, the science about it is those of us, all of us, male and female, are subject to these fluctuations with power positions and we don't understand what's happening to us. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a way in which at some level, and this is not to excuse people, but that people don't understand why, why they're doing what they're feeling what they're feeling and the degree to which they're being influenced by these hormonal factors which rise from positional relationships. So it really does call, I think what Sophie is saying, a lot more awareness bringing it to the surface in the container of Sangha because it's a big factor, it's in play, it's like the most fundamental. Um, and at the same time, putting it in a, in a cultural context where we have roles and we have boundaries and we have to have them for purposes of, of caring for each other requires real consciousness and working with this with a lot of consciousness. Well, you, you just added something that I think is important. So you're saying, you know, actually becoming more awake to our energies and more awake to the implications of our, of our bodies and of our erotic nature. You're saying that we also, and it's interesting in terms of last night, our, the, what was it, the reptile brain and the mouse brain and the primate brain? Because the, as a primate, power and status is massively important to us from down the chimpanzee line. And so instead of what I hear you saying too, Micah, there are implications in terms of power that we can actually become more aware of. What does it mean to have status within a group of human beings? How is status traded? It's often hard to have conversations about sexual scandals without simultaneously talking about power because they're often you know, woven together. So that's another domain where we can get much more awake to what's really going on with us. Well, and, and, and groups in which status or... Hierarchy is more important. Guru devotion, Zen, where there's a, a lot of spiritual power given to the, the leader of the group. First, has issues about intoxication of the leader, and second, has issues about subordination. So that if the group doesn't really process the information about what's really happening from a dynamic standpoint, it makes those groups more susceptible to problems, and it's probably not surprising that the Vajrayana and the Zen schools have had as much problem as any. I'd like to further nuggetize the, uh, the hormone talk. I once read that the moment of, of sexual attraction mimics a kind of brain damage that <laughs> <laughs> shuts down the higher functioning of your brain. But if you've, if you've ever made a poor decision uh, regarding sex in the heat of the moment, there, there's good science behind that. So, so as a practical matter, uh, and I hope Jack hasn't already covered this, but, but as a practical matter, it seems to me that the, the, the prophylaxis, if you will, happens before you find yourself in a room alone with your teacher or your student. It happens when you acknowledge uh, using the, the currently functioning higher functions of the brain that you are susceptible to um, making poor judgments and, to, and to, to being either an abuser or, or, or to being abused. That's actually a nice little frame, frame for some shadow work. Do you want to do some? Just real quickly? Okay, it's not, it's not too much. So what I'd like you to do, if you're willing, and do it whatever level works for you. Don't overexpose yourself. But just basically, I'd like for you to, with a partner that you're sitting next to, if you would just identify a moment where you feel that you made a poor decision related to your sexuality. Just one time in your life where you... Yeah, right, right. So just a moment of just, let's explore that together for a minute. I'll work with shins in here, okay? So I'm going to give you five. I'm going to give you about... So I'll be screwed. <laughs> right. He's worried about this. So I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you two minutes each. So this is a total of five minutes. 
the person with the short hair is going to go first. Just talk for a minute about when you have made a poor decision. You've got two minutes, and then we're going to switch. So go ahead. Let's do it. And, uh, Sophia is actually going to lead us in a little bit of uh, helping to metabolize your experience bodily. So, Sophia, Sophia go ahead and do that. Let's... Oh, Let's look at that for a minute. So either straighten your spine if it feels better. Go ahead and stand up. Really plant your feet on the floor. Let your belly open a little bit so that it's, it feels like it's a little bit more round on top of your thighs, and it's fine if you're sitting or standing. And turn your palms upward or forward, which allows a little bit more nakedness, available feeling. Close your eyes. And then go ahead and point or place your right hand where you feel the most energy from what you just disclosed. So take a nice deep breath into your body to feel it. Go ahead and exhale and draw your right hand right over or onto that area. And then take a couple more breaths and see if instead of fixing or smoothing or soothing, you can just allow the nakedness. Feel it from your heart. And feel from your skin outwards how mutual we are in this conversation. A little bit of bend in the knees keeps you from feeling fear that we walk around with all the time. And a lot more like you're a sea creature rather than the socialized history that you have with your body. Just bounce a little bit. Go ahead and relax your right hand. Bounce a little bit. Take a nice huge breath and let out a little bit of a gargle. And then draw a breath silently in and exhale up your spine. And then keep your knees bent and feel the motion that you've moved and let gravity tug on the base of your body as if you didn't have clothes on. Notice any instantaneous impulse of shame or anything else and feel yourself as if you're a sea creature with three flowers in the base of your body, your anus, your perineum, your genitals. Take a nice huge breath, press the floor away, draw your left hand to your heart and allow a little bit of congratulations for your honesty the depth of your care to actually address a huge area, and you can feel how big it is by how many warbles you have felt in your body. And then a namaste in front of your heart. Go ahead and round your head over and let go. Whatever you need to let go of to open into the next moment. And then gently unfold a very brain-damaged musician recently exclaimed that I got to hear after playing this music when she can't do anything else, all is forgiven. So you just played good music. <laughs> Thank you. So we're, we're listening now from just a slightly different place than we were listening before. So we're going to go into now just really kind of starting to look a bit at some of the injury that actually comes when we are not clear in our uh, erotic sexual energy, particularly when, when we are in a position of leadership. And so we're going to talk first of all about just the, the kind of when a teacher oversteps that boundary, and it's a boundary violation, just like what that experience is for someone who comes in who is uh, seeking, maybe not all that clear on what they're there for, young, inexperienced, and that they, they're coming. The thing about spiritual practice and why this is so important that we clarify this is that people's hearts are on the line. You know, they're, they're bringing their whole life into a moment. So we want to just contemplate for a moment that the, the specifics of that boundary violation. I want to just actually turn to Kenneth for a moment because as he and I were discussing this, 
I was saying that one of the experiences, of course, of being a female, and it's true as it turns out for males as well, are just those moments where you, you feel that, you know, that trespass and the, the, in, the inability to say no or the attractiveness to it or whatever it is, the confusion that can often arise. So we want to just, a little bit of empathy getting generated for that moment. So do you want to yeah. just talk to us about that? Because it's a great story. The setting is mid-90s in a, in a, in a Theravada Buddhist uh, monastery in, in Southeast Asia, in, in Burma, in Rangoon. And uh, I was on long-term retreat and one, one morning, as I was walking up the stairs to, to go to the, the early morning sitting, uh, one, of, one of the monks, the, so the, all of us are walking up these kind of steep stairs together, I think it was a spiral staircase, and one of the monks walks, walked up behind me and slid his hand up inside my sarong to, to stroke my inner thigh. Uh, my immediate reaction was to turn toward him and, and growl at him, don't touch me. And then, uh, then my, my second reaction, which came within moments after that, was to look at all of these, uh, all of these smiling faces. There was there's this, this guy, the monk, and all the, of these other monks smiling up at me. And I was above them on the staircase. And, and, I, and I thought, uh, I don't know how, how I processed this so quickly, but what came out was, I'm not going to buck this trend. And I, and I turned to him and said, good morning, Sayadaw. So my takeaway there is, is two things. One, how really unwelcome it is when somebody touches you and you didn't, didn't tell them it was okay. Uh, and the other is that in that kind of an authoritarian setting, it's very tempting to let it go. My, uh, as I thought about it later, my thinking was, it isn't up to me to fix this culture. Now, for one thing, this, this might just be a lone weirdo. The, the guy happened to be the cousin of the abbot, and he, he got away with things because he could. Another of the senior monks there told me, uh, he said, the guy's got a screw loose. Uh, you want me to tell him to stay away from you? And I said, yeah, tell him to stay away from me by all means. So for me, it's... Uh, I want to be careful not to imagine that I really get what it's like to be molested, because on the scale of molestation, that's fairly minor. But I've had some taste of it. And so I'm, I'm sympathetic to both the uh, feeling of, of uh, betrayal is not the word I'm looking for. It's, um, it's violation. The feeling of violation and the feeling of powerlessness and uh, deciding not to speak out about it. You know, that happened to me, too, in an Asian monastery. Same deal. Same more. Do you want to... No, just same thing. Same yeah. Another monk reaching towards the yeah. genitals. Yeah. I, I just, uh, person, I just shrugged it off, actually. Yeah. It was surprising, though. It never, you know, mm -hmm. it happened. Mm -hmm. I think that the remorse or the shame that I feel about it now is actually not saying anything about it because, uh, because I'm reasonably sure I wasn't the only one mm -hmm. who was being... In my case, this was guy. just a kid, though. You know, it wasn't one of the teachers or anything. Yeah, well, in this case, he wasn't a teacher. He was just he was a monk who lived there and just kind of got away with bad behavior because he was a monk and because he was related to the abbot. Well, there's, a, there's an important point that maybe we should go into a little bit more, which is that in these in cases of, of uh, teachers, that s most often there's a bit of a long history, and there's often a number of incidents of people trying to speak to somebody about it, women trying to speak to a senior monk or a senior student or trying to get it on the table and feeling their voice is marginalized and they're kind of told, hey, it's part of the practice, you know, keep it to yourself. You know, we're, we're like, you know, if you don't expect your ego to be offended here, 
You know, that that's what it's about, is ego offense. I want to talk about the injury to institutions and communities, but what, what about this question about offending the ego of the student? Does that con confuse and conflate this whole issue? Hugely. Can we, can we talk about that a little bit? Maybe Mike, you might have something too. Go ahead. Uh, well, the... Um, Let me just say um, to uh, sort of uh, what, uh, jump off the cliff here uh, <clears throat> and say what I really feel about this situation with Sasaki. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that um, I've heard people say that, uh, well, he must not have had any compassion because how can you uh, be that invasive to people on a regular basis. But uh, in my language, I actually would have to say I don't think that he, that he lacked compassion. I think that his concept of compassion was um, not my concept of compassion. But I think it, it definitely was a concept of compassion, which is essentially um, what is the... Um, what is the kindest thing you can do to, for any human being is to free them from uh, their limited identity. And so if you have a notion that the best way to go about doing that is to utterly devastate on a regular basis their egoic identity, but as you do that, to be coming in that moment from a place of emptiness mm -hmm. so that it's just an event in nature um, that that's a, an effective way and a valid way to teach people. I have to be honest, I really disagree with that. But I, and I can't second guess him, but I think that that's what he, that's part of what was behind that. Um, that's the most compassionate thing you can do. Uh, life's going to mess with you. And if you come from, uh, I mean, he, he was, his parents were born into feudal Japan. Now, authoritarian culture, what kind of authoritarian? Um, the only way that you could uh, get the attention of the authorities, if you weren't an authority, would be to rush in front of uh, the daimyo with a petition. And they would see that petition, and you would be killed. And that's the way... That was the society he was born into, a very uh, stratified, unfair society. So if society is going to be that unfair to you, um, training a person to be abused from a place of not having a self in that moment, that could be looked upon as uh, an effective way to train people. Now, I completely disagree with this. But I can sort of see where it might be coming from. Um, that doesn't say that there weren't genuine negativities behind it. But I think his rationalization was, well, I'm completely empty in the moment when I do this. And the most compassionate thing that I can possibly do for you is utterly destroy any sense of boundary that you might have uh, while coming myself from a place of no boundary. Um, so um, I would say that the problem wasn't the lack of compassion. It was the definition of compassion. And I think that there was a lack of empathy, not a lack of compassion. And that that is an inept way to teach people. But it is a certain cultural way to teach people. And I can sort of see how a certain culture might produce that way of teaching. Is, is this... Is this thing that you're describing right now, is this in any way one of those things that he feels a little taboo to say? Yes. Yeah. So I just want everyone to notice that. He's actually speaking something that in the, in the main discourse of what's going on, because of the cultural imperatives for us to clean this up, this is going to be a little bit hard to, to receive as somehow not in a way legitimizing uh, his behavior. You know, Japanese master, 105 years old now. 106. 106. 
what I wonder, what, what, what I like to say, I don't know if there's room for this, it's a little bit of humor, but why didn't people deal with this 10, 15 years ago when he was 90 or 95? <laughs> what the hell? What was he doing in his 66? <laughs> I mean, there is a little element of like, well, you know, it's kind of crazy. I mean, and this is really politically incorrect. Brace yourselves. This is in no way excusing him, but damn, 105. <laughs> to that guy. That dude has some life force. You know, while we're... And that's an uh, unspoken shadow that I know some of you have out there. While we're saying what we're not supposed to ever say, yeah. I, I used to, like, gee, I wish I was a woman. <laughs> With him. Say more. It, well, Say more. Look, it. they all got it's quiet. Like, Go ahead. Well, I could, uh, then I could have that experience. Oh, that you would get that kind of intimacy that and intimacy. attention. Yeah. 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 I could have sex with him. Yeah, wow. Wow. Wow, that's not something that gets spoken very much. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. 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 I'm speaking it. Yeah. Well, it's, the, you know, the challenge here is the interior and the exterior of the, uh, of the student-teacher relationship and the sangha to the exterior world relationship. I mean, if the sangha were encapsulated and had no connection with the outer world or no context... These yeah, well, can, I, can I frame that for you? Because sure. I, I want to hear what you have to say about this. So one of the things that happens in this discourse that we really have to pay attention to a lot, people focus a lot on the conduct of the teacher. People focus a lot on the offense to victims. But what people don't do quite as skillfully is make a distinction between the, the implications on an individual level and what might be good for one individual has impacts in the community. So I might need a certain kind of sexual liberation, and maybe I can find the right master and seek that out. But what the community agreements are, what the, the uh, stability needs of the community are, they, those two things might not match up. So I want to, Mike is a, an, an expert in terms of, of institutions. He used to be the chief justice of our, of our judiciary. He thinks a lot about fairness, and he thinks a lot about institutional integrity and what it takes for something like the court system to maintain a certain kind of stability over time. So the impact on communities and institutions, I'm just well, curious I mean, uh, about your views on that. Granting everything Shinzen saying, and I can completely identify with, uh, you know, the intimacy, the need for intimacy with your teacher. I mean, uh, you know, that relationship is... is uh, and love. Love, I mean, this Third tremendous brain. close closeness. You can't get enough of your teacher. Um, which isn't about, it doesn't feel like it's about power. It feels it's about love. At the same time, um, there's the Sangha as a whole. So if the teacher, if, if for example, a student goes to a teacher and says, I see something going on here that troubles me. And the teacher says, this is not your concern. So as a student, I can say, well, I'm surrendering to the teacher. I'm giving up my moral understanding or even my sense of harm to the community as part of my dropping myself. It's a tricky moment. But in the it's long run, which is, I think, I've experienced that, and I've experienced the love for my teacher in the same way you're talking about. But then... If I watch and this, this becomes corrosive within the community, it may not only devastate the community, which it's certainly doing to Suzaki's community, but it puts the Dharma in peril to a degree, at least that line of it for some period of time. And it puts all the work of how many people over how many years, decades, in jeopardy. Um, and you know we've Diane and I have experienced that in our own in our own community. So there's this tension between the relationship with the teacher, the desire to surrender, the love for the teacher, and the teacher's skill. And then there's this whole question of whether the teacher is really, no matter what, how clear the teacher may be, is the teacher clear in all lines and levels? Does the teacher really understand all that's going on for him or her? 
Well, and again, that the individual interest, genuine dharmic spiritual interest in, in support of an individual student or in the relationship, that that very thing could be detrimental to the community. Yeah. You know, that, there, there's, a, there's a, a problem there. There's, what this points to for me is, a, is an unexamined assumption that, that I have uh, had at times and no longer do but I see a lot of it around, and it's the idea that subjective experience is everything. Mm -hmm. My inner space trumps anything that will happen in the community. It's simply not true. And I think we should acknowledge that as wonderful as meditation is, and I'm a big advocate of meditation, <laughs> it's not going to solve all of the problems. It's not going to solve social injustice. Uh, and I think we have a blind spot about that. That's one of the things in our shadow, our collective shadow, and our individual shadow that I'd like to shine a light on. Who says if you meditate enough, it's all going to come out right? <laughs> yeah. and that, that was somewhat a motivation for me formulating that uh, three basic goals mm -hmm. thing, to sort of have a simple model so that you could see where imbalance would occur. If there's too much emphasis on transcending and not <clears throat> enough emphasis on refining the individual, and if you don't know all the five things that I mentioned that are needed to refine an individual as an individual, then there, you run into uh, the potential for uh, these kinds of problems. But I think if you are aware of all those dimensions, um, um, then... Uh, we can avoid these kinds of problems. Also, there's this huge assumption that somehow uh, one has to surrender um, in order to, to a teacher in order to make progress. That's never been my paradigm. I mean, not even remotely. Um, uh, teacher is just a coach uh, with some knowledge uh, that can encourage you. Um, and that's about it. Um, yeah, that's so, my so, feeling you know, the, well. the, I mean, that's how I always think about myself. I'm just a coach. Um, so the notion that, uh, that has, I think has be, we've, been, we've inherited from certain traditions in Buddhism, which is that uh, we, we just assume that surrendering to a teacher is part of the process. Um, um, well, a different way of saying it, Shinzen, a different understanding of what you're saying right now is that there's an assumption that the non-dual awareness of the master, it, it, by tuning your mind to the mind of the master, that you, perhaps your perception beyond your egoic concerns. You know what I mean? So it isn't just simply doing what the teacher and, says. And I would claim that that, the merging uh, with the teacher, uh, belongs to a different dimension than surrendering to the teacher. So that you can have that experience of merging with, with a teacher and uh, getting that hit of energy uh, without in any way surrendering to the, that teacher. Uh, in any do you way mean, at do you all. mean surrendering your life? Or decisions. anything. You're uh, uh, accept, accepting them as an authority mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. You can still have that... Uh, Shaktipat, or whatever you want to call it, without a notion that there is uh, any um, loss of agency. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the slightest to that teacher. Loss of agency. I think it might be good to surrender your perspective periodically, but perhaps not your agency. I like so that. I would, I would not even want to surrender one's perspective. You wouldn't? I, you know, even that, to me, is too invasive okay. for the style of teaching I would want people to do. Fair enough. In the tradition that, that I'm trained in, which is Burmese uh, Mahasi style Vipassana, there just never was any talk about surrendering to your teacher, other than you have to do what he says because you're in his monastery and you have to meditate the way he talks, he, he tells you to do it. Fair enough. But no, there, there, the relationship between the teacher and the student actually wasn't emphasized. It was, uh, it was very old school Buddhism. You are your own salvation. Do the practice and, and get the results. The teacher was, was a coach. I also, I just want to follow up, Shinzen. You, you talked about the various things that have to come together uh, in order for, a, for an individual 
to get herself or himself together. But, but I also want to say there is more than the individual. So the, the culture has to get itself together. The, the, uh, the relationship has to get itself together. So if we, if we believe basic Buddhist theory that there isn't anybody in here anyway, <clears throat> then I can't get myself together. Uh, so it's just as... <laughs> It's, it's just as reasonable to say that we can awaken as, as a community or as a relationship or that the relationship can awaken as it is to say that I can awaken. Either one of those things has their, has their, uh, their, their flaws and their advantages as points of view. But I think it has to be, uh, both of those things have to be done practically speaking. Is, uh, is it fair to regard these Scandals as processes of communities awakening? This, is that, that a fair is, frame? That yes. we're actually evolving culture? Mm -hmm. And this is things that were put up with in the past are just no longer acceptable, and those things are starting to be ferreted out? Is that fair? I think, I think it, it's it fair to think be. of it as uh, growing pains of uh, growing a true pain. modern spirituality. Uh -huh. I think it's also a shift of culture from Asian cultures teacher-dominated cultures, feudal culture, to Western culture and American culture. You can't, you can't have a community where, well, you can, but it isn't going to last very long if you have a community with this kind of conduct in the legal context of sexual harassment laws, that sort of thing. Communities are not going to survive that. Yeah, they won't. That's so okay. there's just a cultural, legal, cultural context that makes it not really tolerable in the long run. In other words, we have to grow up and get healthy. If we're going to be any kind of legal. player in this get culture. Legal. <laughs> get legal, people. What were you going to say? Go ahead. I was going to say that um, just, well, there was a few points that Shinzen brought up that, um, well, I, my heart is still, like, cracked open from what you offered previous to this tag that we got on, but that um, we have a... We have inherited a very, very uh, childish culture relative to surrender. And it's just an inheritance, just like the legal system has a certain way of evolving, which we actually are held to, but it doesn't um, actually follow a, an incredible realization such as we revere of the Buddhas. And so the bringing together of a new culture that learns how to, learns what it is to surrender less in the childish paradigm that we're all entrained in, even if you weren't born into Christianity, it's a very dualistic father-child kind of thing that I think we're all part and parcel of, that if you join something, you kind of expect to be taken somewhere, whereas you know, in, in India, for sure, the bigger the master, the more they needed to th literally, some of them would throw poop at you because you should be afraid for your life to come any closer. And taking into consideration just the radical nature of somebody who is more realized than just the culture, the general culture might allow, I think is the challenge that we're talking about, which I also felt in, ha in the rap. Well, I would say the love is, I would say that the love is unique and this can only happen in this context of this conversation, not in a more politicized one, is the kind of love that you feel when somebody liberates you permanently from radically torturous egoity is even more than a lover, you know? It is, it's, it's a unique kind of love and I, I am positive because I've experienced it both in the entrainment of the South Indian Temple Arts and in my own case relative to the tradition that I studied under, which was a very radical master, Adi Das Amraj, that um, there is a love principle that demands more discrimination than we're even culturally bound to. Mm -hmm. You have to grow up and take responsibility at a much bigger level for every gesture that you make toward dissolution 
based on love, you have to take more responsibility instead of surrender into whatever that is. But the kind of love, I actually think, is what needs to be mapped Mm -hmm. in this context because it doesn't happen with a teacher-student. It happens with a body that is pouring out a realization that is really uncommon. So I make a distinction between a teacher and somebody with a a siddha that has siddhi, which means their personality has parted to reveal something, and they will never adhere to any cultural context, but they do have to appear in one. Mm -hmm. And that the kind of love that comes up in that case needs new definitions and new check marks of what responsibility for that kind of love is. And it can only happen, I think, in the context of the intimacy of a community and then possibly be communicated more publicly so that it meets the legal system to not get in trouble. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. 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 In other words, you're you're saying that there there there's still a spiritual training that is unconventional by its nature and that those masters will always be around and how how that gets translated into the mainstream and into legal structures is a challenge, but there's room for that. Mm-hmm. Am I hearing you? Totally. And I think this conversation attests to it that I you know, I have seen my own community, like, you know, I thought I'd gotten somewhere. I was so fat and pretty sitting on my cushion following all the rules. And then Adida himself pulled all the rules away, and nothing pertained anymore. You weren't a level. You weren't a particular relationship. And the dismantling um, seems like a necessary process, but... It's the continual conversation of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and not throwing away your cherished recognition with the challenges that it is to meet a new dimension of our humanity. Yeah, is, and I think one of the challenges for people in these communities is how to, actually, how to actually really still hold on, revere, and be grateful for what you received and at the same time acknowledging something ain't right. You know what my metaphor has always been, uh, and it was the metaphor I had... Uh, from the beginning of my relationship to every teacher I ever had, and it was very strong with uh, Sasaki Roshi, I always felt that I was like a, a fish that would, uh, was nibbling on a piece of bait and that there was a hook in there mm-hmm. and that my job was to just nibble without getting the hook. <laughs> and, <clears throat> uh, and I would strongly encourage, uh, you know, if I had my say in things, that uh, everyone sort of think about it that way. Um, there's always going to be a hook. I try my best not to have a hook, <laughs> but I know it's going to be in there somehow. How can it not be? So uh, as far as I'm concerned, we are allowed to graze on the Dharma. That's what I did with Sasaki. I was never officially a student, which is a big deal in Japan. But he let me graze from the outside. He let you nibble. I, and I took what worked for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what worked for me was his paradigm mm-hmm. about how consciousness works. He was a role model. I have never met a human being that was that tireless in service. No vacations. He just did one retreat after another retreat after another retreat. Um, and I've never met anyone that could give you such a hit of dynamic emptiness. Um, but I didn't like the koan way of teaching, to be honest. It just didn't seem like good pedagogy. Uh, <laughs> since I'm telling all. Uh, uh, but that's just me. I never quite got that. I, I like the systematic way of doing, you know, vipassana. And it seemed like really brutal uh, and cruel and, uh, you know, and it was authoritarian. And now I see that he also sort of had sex as part of the koan system. Uh, so it's like, okay, you know what? I can still take the good parts. Yeah. And I'm very clear about what works and I'm very clear about what doesn't work. And I'm not confused at all that these can coincide in a single human being. Because you have a mind that can handle complexity. 
Well, or contradiction, so maybe I passed a co-op. <laughs> maybe you did. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's open it up to your questions. Let's open it up. But I, I think the one point I'd like to make about what Sophia is saying, too, is that I think in our communities, uh, as we grow up, as we mature, as we adapt to the culture we're actually in, as we you know, integrate all of our understanding, that ethical training will take us so far but embodied training is really where it's at in terms of that actually making a difference. You know, it's like I feel, I was one time in the, in the company of a Weichel Indian who was 90 years old and drinking tequila all night long and running a ceremony and honestly created a rainstorm. And when it was all over, just making just massively inappropriate um, comments and things to the young women. I mean, anybody who was under 22. And so, you know, my, my response to that was I felt as a female that my obligation was actually to work with them. Like, what is it you can say? What can you do to actually... Because he's 90 years old, you know? It's like Suzaki Roshi. He, he's got a lot of cultural baggage. But what made sense to me is that as a female, what can I actually do to, to help a young woman learn how to say no in a way that doesn't feel threatening to her? Like, I think there's a lot we can learn about, as you were saying, our bodies, our energies. The ethical considerations are really important ones, but becoming much more... Uh, you know, so that we can actually take you up on your invitation, you know, to be fully erotic, awake, alive human beings. And if we need particular training, to go to, to people who do that training. Not to look to your meditation master to be the one to help you with your sexual embodiment, but actually be interested in growing yourself in that way. That's going to go a long way to all of us growing up, in my view. So. And the Sangha needs to take responsibility. The Sangha the needs to take responsibility as well, and the students, so... So let's have some of your questions, and it would be helpful if you would uh, point them. And if you could make a distinction, <coughs> if you have a comment instead of a question, if you could just label that. Because one of the things that's hard is when you get a question, that by the very end you realize that wasn't a question. It was a comment. <laughs> yeah, so anybody, please, the mic's open. We've got a few minutes left. We'd love to just, and if you'd be specific about who you want to talk to, that would be helpful. Hi. Um, this is for the panel in general, and um, thank you very much for addressing this topic. Um, this might be kind of a controversial question. It is a question, um, so I just want to acknowledge that and, and say that I'm, I'm really asking this in the spirit of compassion and inquiry. Um, but I'd be really curious to hear um, the relationship between the, sen you know, the sense of a non-self and um, agency and right life. And just to put a little context around that in terms of what is the responsibility of the victim to take agency and say, this isn't right? And what do you do as a community when the victim doesn't actually have the capacity to understand that responsibility because of possibly um, a, a, an experience and a patterning that where um, saying no, there, there's a different choice and a different reality around abuse um, doesn't exist for that person. I would, you know, if I could, yeah, I would recommend, actually, the book section of Spiritual Teacher is very good. The Faith Trust Institute has a bunch of materials on this subject, which basically say, and I think you're seeing more and more communities moving this way, uh, and we're going to do in the White Plum, you're going to have to have a code of conduct. You're going to have to have the teacher make a commitment to certain ways of behaving. You're going to have to have processes in place for people to complain. And then I expect that the White Plum as a, as a whole, as an institution, will be available for people who can't get, uh, get their complaints considered by their Sangha. So Sanghas as institutions, Buddha Dharma Sangha, and Sangha has to actually put in place some structures to create expectations in students so that they can feel held in an appropriate way. Now, whatever the Sangha, you know, if you want to have a Sangha that, that tolerates conduct, teacher-student sexual relations, that should be express. You want to make it express, make it express. But the Sangha bears responsibility is that, is that the free for love, articulating Is that, that the free love provision? I guess, <laughs> Free but it's kind of a notice Paragraph issue, three, because that three. then empowers the students. <laughs> and I'm not sure if I heard you right. Um, that part of your question had to do with helping a victim who actually doesn't want to step up 
Is that, is that accurate? And um, I think really, really important in all of this is to notice how attached we are to what we are going to lose. That to outgrow a violative gesture means that you might lose the context of that relationship, and that is right. You know, that is in a, at a certain level. But the reasons for not actually, you know, stepping forward or having not taking community's help in stepping forward, the question to me is, what is at stake for that person to not make that gesture? And it is a huge gesture of growing up no matter how you slice it. Once you've been violated, the world is different and you can't put it back the way it was. So to look at what is lost and to make good decisions moving forward that aren't about continual availability to being violated. And it could mean not being in the same context, which is a huge loss a lot of times. Yeah, so, so what, I, what, I, what I'm hearing Sophia say is, the question as you're asking it is, is if, you, if you don't know how to say no, then that's what we mean by victim, is that you actually don't have the capacity to refuse something because it's not within your, it's not an object in your mind to be able to say no. But I think what Sophia is saying is, is for any of us who've experienced ourselves as victims, and we all have in one way or another, we can find that part of ourselves as well. But what you're saying is, what would it take for me to actually liberate that particular identification? And that all of us can be challenged in a certain moment to give away this idea that I'm completely, I've been screwed over. Is that what you're saying? Did I hear that right? And also that sometimes it is the loss of the treasured relationship, you know? Like, yeah. you don't speak up because you're going to lose something. Yeah. And it's sometimes the confrontation with what you're going to lose more than it is the confrontation with the person themselves. Okay. Cool. Yeah, please. So, <clears throat> so this, I guess, is about two-thirds comment and one-thirds question, and it's basically addressed to everyone. But... Um, I have to say I've been a little disappointed with this because it's hard for me to imagine how a conversation about sex and spirituality could have been kind of drier and more inoffensive. <laughs> I mean, you know, okay. hormone levels and all this kind of stuff. I mean, this is such an energetic area that we're talking about here. And so here's... Energize here's, us. Here's, so here's Energize my comment us. part. Do as, it. as an analogy... I'm thinking of mountaineering, mountain climbing, which, you know, people use this as a spiritual analogy all the time. And some people go to the... But wait, I'm getting bored, too. So you're, you're, you're saying, <laughs> you know... Yeah. You're, 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 you're the one with the you're, stage, yeah, so you're you have the power. Yeah, so you can I'll, tell me what to do. That would be handy for us. I'm with you. I'm with you. I really am. So some people like to go to the Himalayas and climb Mount Everest and, you know, and have, like, a really unusual and powerful experience, but maybe you'll die. And other people like to go down to the local gym and you strap on a multi-point harness and there's a hydraulic automatic belaying system and there's liability insurance and all this stuff. Do so you want to sleep with your teacher or not? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would, actually. Okay. But that's a whole other I mean, story. is that the metaphor? I'm, I'm actually trying to get the analogy that you're making. To be so the, the question is, I mean, what I would like to see here is not so much a matter of how can we make sure that no one ever falls off Mount Everest and dies, I would like to see how can we structure our communities so people can be honest with themselves about whether they want to go out into the wilderness where it's very risky, but there's also the potential for great rewards, or do they want to stay at the local climbing gym where they won't be challenged as much, but they're also not going to die? I mean, I think all of these things, I mean, like some people really are benefited and liberated by having some really extreme experiences, and some people are just crushed by it. So how do we figure out how to get people to the right place now I hear without question. putting a railing around everything? Yeah. You know, we I hear a question. Yeah. Heart. I hear a question. Yeah. Anybody? Go study with David Data for a weekend. <laughs> you know, pick your pick your masters. You know. Yeah. What do you guys have to say to this? Well, I was just going to say is the roundabout way that you also presented yourself is actually care. You know, there's just so many perspectives in this room. The fact that we're having this conversation to me makes me ecstatic. I have to conduct it and sit here. And be, <laughs> but it is, it is really amazing 
just to even have this conversation with so many different possible perspectives. So even that you had to use an analogy instead of, I want to sleep with my teacher and I have no problem with it. And who's with me? <laughs> so since you've challenged me like that, I just want to say that theoretically I would want to sleep with my teacher and I have no problem with that. And who's with me? <laughs> That's the part well, of judge. Yeah. Oh, and thank you, Sophie. Theoretically. Yeah. You have no idea what a relief that is because I thought that I uh, really was, should have really kept a lid on. <laughs> I was worried about uh, God. I just let it all hang out. So if you think, if you think that, we, that I was too contained, then that's a huge relief. Thank you. <laughs> And yet, I can see how the context seemed to make that the appropriate behavior. So why is that? It just happened. Well, I would say just pick your teacher really carefully. Yeah. <laughs> well, really, okay, and, and I don't mean that. I mean pick really the con- and pick carefully. The context. Or, uh, you know, I think uh, that's like a really nice statement. Uh, we wanted to say something new. And that, what, what you said hadn't occurred to me, that that is a dimension that people can mm-hmm can think about. It's like, okay, um, what about, uh, uh, you know, um, those kinds of extremes? I think the, you know, um, if it's, uh, I think consensuality, informed consent, deep informed consent is what you're pointing to. And if there's deep informed consent, uh, something that may be three or four standard deviations from a cultural norm could, in theory. <laughs> so I, I think that's really saying something. As long that, as you don't lie to anybody in the community. <laughs> Is that right? I mean, well, that's where the, the collective starts to get. Yeah. yeah. I think you've hit on it a little bit there. And like, maybe we have to, this is more of a comment, I guess, <laughs> uh, look at um, communities that have complex. Uh, consent models, like the BDSM community and the queer community and the polyamorous community, who actually are open about these kind of things and and have complex consent models. I think it'd be good to look at those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great, yeah, great. And like you were saying that, it's, right? It's easy to find online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I think Michael was making that point, and I'm glad you reiterated it, because he's saying you can create a culture mm-hmm. in which that's the case. I think one of the, one of the difficulties is that uh, it means being really rigorous with yourself and what you want as a teacher, as a student. And uh, uh, sometimes my experience has been that some teachers, in position, people in positions of power, they, they, they sort of want a post-conventional uh, private life, but they want a really conventional public life so that they can be interviewed by Time Magazine or whatever it is. So you give up a lot. There's a lot to move into a, a, a real post-conventional uh, culture that also has integrity, but I like that you make that suggestion. Yeah, and I, I would just like to say, yeah, it sounds dry, but having witnessed the aftermath of some, some t- teacher scandals that 25 years later are still casting long shadows on communities, on fabulous teachers who do stuff in secret. It comes out, blows the community apart. The successors are haunted by it. Now, you know, what's the first Buddhist commandment? Do no harm. Now, you may want the third or fourth degree of standard deviation. That's great. But find somebody who's honest about it. But... Being honest about it shrinks your community, shrinks your funding base, shrinks your donors, <laughs> shrinks your fame. <laughs> and if you want to be fame, you know, on Double X websites, that's one thing. If you want to be famous and be interviewed by <laughs> Tricycle Magazine, you better toe the line, which means you better not be duplicitous. So I think that's a good point. But there so is- I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking for the puritanical standpoint or the honesty standpoint. So would you say that? All people in all jobs have an obligation to be honest about their private lives? I, mean, I would say if I have a role, if I, if I have a role and you come to me as a spiritual teacher with, with your most precious aspirations, which know no bounds, 
that you and I better have a good understanding of the scope of my role vis-a-vis -vis you. And I'm not your financial advisor. I'm not your psychological advisor. I'm not your sexual advisor unless you want to engage me on that plane candidly and I agree to it. But you have obligations to your board and your other students. I have obligations to my other students. If I'm sleeping with you and I'm not telling them about it, and I'm sleeping with you and two others and I'm not telling them about it, I am brewing for everybody who's brought their dearest aspirations, their lives to this practice I've exposed them that in five, ten years, this community blows up, they are disillusioned, and I have done cr incredible dharmic damage. So I have a huge responsibility, and if I don't take that responsibility seriously, whatever you want from me, apart from everybody else in the community, I owe an obligation to the whole community, I owe an ob obligation to the dharma, I owe an obligation to my teacher and my lineage. And if I'm not willing to be honest with you and be honest with the community, I am not worthy of your fondest and highest hopes for your life. That's my view. I read an article recently about another, you know, yet another sex scandal with a teacher. And everything I read seemed to indicate that the scandal was that the teacher was having sex with someone, but there wasn't anyone who ever claimed that they had been harmed by the teacher. It was just that everyone kind of has this idea that a teacher having sex with a student is kind of inherently a bad thing. And so now it's this whole big deal. And, you know, no, they didn't tell everybody who they were having sex with all the time because nobody does that. And nobody is coming forward and saying, this person lied to me and manipulated me into having sex. But we are in a cultural situation right now where, you know, like you said, with the Jack Cornfield background, there's kind of this assumption that it's just morally wrong for people to have sex across power differentials or knowledge differentials or any kind of difference. Unless you make a different set of agreements. Yeah. That's what we're saying. Yeah. Is we're saying that, that the, the psychological community has agreed that therapists should be precluded from that, that clergy should be precluded from that, that people in positions of power that are imbued specifically for another purpose that creates a tremendous amount of confusion that, that most of those have ethical um, policies now that prevent that. And so unless you create a culture with a different set of agreements, then there's a problem there. Yeah. So the woman, the person behind, I think, was, is waiting. So we might want to go to him and then to her. We probably have time for two more and we'll wrap it up. Oh, you don't have a question? You're just... Okay. 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 Yeah. Well, I was just okay. going to say that I, I went Please. through something like this mm -hmm. in graduate school. And it's a different kind of teacher-student relationship. But my graduate advisor was sleeping with two of my fellow female students. And mm -hmm. I finally went, I found out about this when it was by accident. And I went to him and I told him how I felt. And he berated me and told me it was none of my business. And I sat there and cried and cried. And then what ended up happening is I turned myself, because I desired to please him. I mean, this was deeply ingrained in me. I turned myself into his confidant. And the whole thing was totally twisted. And so I'm agreeing with you. Maybe that teacher and that student were perfectly cool with each other. Although it later turned out they weren't. I mean, a marriage was broken up about it, and then the student's career was almost destroyed. But um, it splashes over onto others. And uh, Shinzen, I understand how you felt. I felt like, why did he choose her? You know, there was some sense of feeling I would want to have had him. So I, so I chose to be his confidant instead, mm -hmm. which, as I said, I compromised my integrity doing it. The whole group of us were abuzz with drama the entire time for years, okay? It's, there are what I would call unintended consequences. So I'm just kind of answering the question, why is this necessarily bad? Maybe it isn't always bad, but I would say the danger of it being really bad is quite serious. Thank you for letting me have your, your time. This was just a comment. Okay, this is our last
last one, huh? Our last one? Kenneth, our last? Last one? This is our last question, guys. It's almost six. Yeah. Um, Please. I would like to know more about your guys' perspective as teachers. How has being a teacher affected your relationship with sexuality? Positively, negatively? Mm. Great question. Wow. Yeah. Should we do like a 30 seconds each? <laughs> <laughs> I already told all <laughs> Because I teach a body practice and um, because I practice what I preach, I actually neutralize myself to teach men because I am a highly polarized woman. I wasn't born in the neutral spectrum of being a woman. I'm extreme on the feminine end, and I pay a price for it. In my adrenals, I pay a price for it. Um, Not negatively, but energetically in intimacies, but I am aware of it. And it has been a conscious offering, and I'm glad I've done it because um, it's just obvious to me that some of what I hold is really important in this time, and especially for both sexes. So that's my particular, yeah. uh, my particular thing. But I teach a body practice, too, so I'm like, there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. Ken, how about you? Yeah, Ken. I, until I was 30, I was, a, I was a musician. I was a rock musician, and I toured with bands, and I, I had lots of sex. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, 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 I suppose it was, it was fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I must say, it was a great relief when I, when I got really interested in meditation and then kind of got recruited to teach meditation and decided very early on that I wasn't even going to date my students, let alone sleep with them. And it, on balance, it's been a good thing. I, I feel better about myself since then. I'm married now, and it, there's even more motivation to, to uh, draw that line. So uh, it has negatively impacted my sex life in terms of numbers of partners. <laughs> it has it it positively affected my life in, in many ways that I value more than that. I think that for me as a, as a Zen teacher that, that a lot of this is really, I, th- I would say prior to all these so-called scandals that I I think I was a narcissistic boomer that sort of believed that my sexuality was my business and what transpired between me and my partners, whoever they happened to be, was really my own business. And I've really woken up to the the karmic impacts and the responsibility to others and how deceit plays in these things and how undermining unconsciousness in in the sexual domain can be. So I have an agreement with my students, which is that they have my commitment that I will never sleep with a student and that uh, I will do my best to keep my erotic life in integrity, and beyond that, it's none of their business. <laughs> so that's where it's at with me. Um, I would say for myself, as the uh, years uh, have passed and my understandings have deepened, um, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me what the, um, the jewel in the lotus actually is. Mm-hmm. By that I mean it's becoming clearer and clearer what people are actually trying to have when they're having sex or amorous interactions. And as that has become clearer and clearer what true love truly is, um, I uh, have found that the sexual issue has become less and less uh, problematic. Um, I think that uh, since becoming a teacher, um, I've actually found that that it's uh, being mindful of my own erotic attraction to students has been a great practice because it helped. It's actually helped me see it in my life in general. I mean, it just as I move through the world, you know with other people of other polarities, as uh, she was saying. And it's actually, you know, it's getting in that practice of really watching your own erotic energy uh, is a very powerful practice. It's a very powerful meditative subject. So, um, and I'm committed to, to, to 
not getting any erotic connections with students, but you know, it's impossible not to watch your own vibration with people. And to watch it is actually deeply informative, I find. Mm. Just, just to satisfy him, I think, <laughs> what, if, what if Mike had said, I am committed to having a sexual relationship with every student, but I'm completely honest with the Sangha about it. <laughs> <laughs> Not just the ones who want it. There you go. Pick and choose, pick and choose. Three standards of deviation. (laughs) Standards of deviation, right? Not standard deviations. Notice that he became the police officer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this was a successful conversation. Yeah, may may uh, may uh, all beings become liberated because of the quality of your listening and your good care and your intention today. Thank you so much, everybody, and thanks to our panel.